Hello, and thank you all for joining us for uh, the Intelligence and Security Studies Faculty Spotlight. Uh, today, we are talking with the newest member of our program, uh, Mr. Mark Chandler. Now, Mr. Mark Chandler comes to us uh, with a great deal of educational experience. He has a, a master's degree in international relations from Troy State University and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of Alabama, Huntsville. But beyond these things, uh, Mr. Chandler is our professor of practice. And so Professor Chandler um, brings a wealth of practical experience from the field of intelligence to this position. So why don't we start there? Uh, Mark, tell us some about your, your practical experiences uh, in terms of, of what you've done uh, in the field of intelligence. Well, John, thank you very much for that introduction. And, and I appreciate the opportunity here. It, it is quite an honor for me to be selected by the faculty to be part of this great faculty team and the great program that, that you've established and are looking to grow. Uh, real quickly, a little bit about my background. I, I joined the Marine Corps and, and served 21 years there as an intelligence officer. And, and that saw me in deployments around the globe. Uh, I served in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. That's probably well before many of our students uh, came into being here. Uh, my last big overseas deployment was in 2003 during the initial stages of uh, the Iraq operations uh, that took place. So I, I had that overseas experience. I retired from the Marine Corps in 2005 at the end of at the end of 2005. And then I, I began a career, if you will, in uh, defense intelligence. I started out uh, as a civilian uh, working my way, I, I guess you will, again, up the chain of command. And in my last 10 years or so, we're as a, as a senior, what's called a senior executive in the senior executive service in defense intelligence, where I, I worked in the office of secretary of defense for intelligence, doing warfighter support, working with combatant commands. And then I moved in, in probably one of the, the most rewarding times of my civilian career was as a deputy J2 for the joint chiefs of staff. Uh, that was three and a half years of, of little sleep, hard work, but right in the middle of our national security policy events uh, from 2012 to uh, the end of 2015. It, it was a phenomenal growth experience and learning experience. From there, I went to Defense Intelligence Agency and became the director of the Middle East and Africa Center, uh, the largest production and analysis center in, in DIA. And then my last three and a half years or so, I was asked to move to the Air Force to help reestablish Air Force analysis. And that was a rewarding experience. And I think that probably brought me back a little bit to my education uh, desires, because one thing we had to make sure all the Air Force analysis organizations were meeting standards. We had to identify the standards that the Def uh, Director of National Intelligence came up with. And, and we had to go out there and teach those. And I think it's it's from that that it reinvigorated one of my Marine Corps experiences of, of teaching to go out and teach and ensure that we could bring along the requirements and help people understand those. And, and then I retired last year, my wife and I moved to Myrtle Beach. Oh, fantastic. So um, with regard to, uh, uh, for the layman, they may not know what it means to be a deputy J2. Um, so could you could you explain to a little bit more about what what that means in terms of its significance within the Joint Chiefs of Staff? OK, I will. And, and that's that's right. We are not talking to everyone who gets to live that every day. I apologize. So in the military hierarchy, especially in some of the more senior positions, the, the military, the Joint Chiefs of Staff are the senior military advisors uh, to the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States, the chairman has what's called his staff. And they're called usually J staffs or G staffs. J for joint, G for general officer. And then they're numbered. Intelligence is always two. And, and so there is a senior intelligence, military intelligence officer that is assigned as the principal advisor for that. And then the way it's structured to ensure continuity because general officers and flag officers rotate all the time on a sometimes a yearly basis, every two years, a senior civilian. 
So the top civilian in that organization is assigned as the deputy for continuity. And, and you're, it's a symbiotic relationship. You are actually one with that flag officer, that general officer. I, I served during my three and a half years with three different flag officers who rotated through PCSD and came out. And actually, I, I was one of the only two civilians who have been an interim J2 for the Joint Chiefs during, during a period of absence of the uniform folks. So we, as civilians, help oversee the entire process and, and stand in there. Many times I was with the chairman on, on key national security events, just as that uniform officer would be. Uh, but it took a long time for me to work my way to that status as it does a flag officer or general officer to work their way. Hopefully that clarified that a little bit. But yeah, I mean, again, the, the, the experience as, as kind of one of the, the senior intelligence people talking to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs um, and really puts you squarely at the center of, of some of the key national security events that happened for our country in that time period from 2012 to 2015. So I, again, another one of the aspects of the, of the great wealth of experience you bring to our program. Um, I, I noticed that, of course, you, you have a, a very wide array of experience having worked with the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, uh, having recently worked with um, with a defense contractor, uh, I wonder though. At one point, you worked for as the head of foreign uh, deception or denial and deception. Uh, I wonder if you tell us a little bit, or what you could, about that experience. That 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 was great. It, you know, I had a few learning experiences. I said the J deputy J two position was probably my best as civilian, but when I was transitioning out of the Marine Corps. My, my first real assignment coming into civilian intelligence was uh, I, DIA hired me as the head of the denial and deception branch or division within D DIA before they did a, a massive reorg here several years ago. That was one of the most eye-opening uh, experiences that I have had because our focus wasn't just on what our adversaries did and and but it's how they try to protect. And what I learned a great deal is our adversaries understand a great deal about us and how we collect information and process information. And they, they go about through tremendous efforts to hide their true capabilities. And, and that experience actually uh, has paid dividends throughout the, everything that followed there. Because one thing looking at uh, North Korea, China, Russia, uh, then and then actually some of the non-state actors that we would call terrorists, understanding how they could manipulate the system, if you will, to make us see something that wasn't there or not see something that was there. That understanding is critical to our analyst as we go forward to, you know, everything isn't as it seems out there sometimes. <laughs> to be sure. Well, I, I know that you um, you spoke a little bit about this, uh, but I wanted to, to get a chance to talk a little bit more about, uh, we are certainly very glad that you are here. Uh, and I know you spoke about realizing the value of education as, as you were coming towards the end of, of your defense intelligence career. Uh, but now that you're here at, at Coastal as a professor, uh, what are you hoping to do? <laughs> well, I, I one, again, I, I just, I'm from Alabama, so I'm happier than a pig in slop, as we say back in Alabama. Uh, but this is a great opportunity where I would love, and, and my goal is while I'm here, to take my experiences and, and how those translated. And, and to be honest, I made a lot of mistakes. And if I can, one, pass on to the students that mistakes are okay, mistakes are how you grow, but then help them avoid some of those that I made through, through their knowledge, through creating knowledge with each of the students so that when they step out, I, I believe that what we can produce here are students who will step into the intelligence career field that are much more prepared than say I was. Uh, today's students are smarter, they're more tech savvy, the world is more challenging, but if I can, if you will, pay it forward, and help those students prepare themselves for the early stages of their career. Everything else is up to them after that, but there's a, a lot of school of hard knocks that hopefully I can help them avoid, but help them understand the nuances between 
perhaps of what's in some of the textbooks and what really takes place out there, because I believe we need a strong foundation of knowledge and understanding. And then from that, situations dictate what is going to take place and how they're going to, if you will, implement that knowledge in a current situation. And I hope to help them do that. And then where I can, I want to find the, the right course mixes to help the students and kind of support the curriculum that, that you've established here that's a strong, solid curriculum, but find where I can nuance a couple of things to give those students that advantage. Well, we certainly are looking forward to that. Again, um, you know, our faculty now have uh, eight full-time members of which you're one, and, and, um, and we've all made contributions, but your contribution in terms of the experience and background um, is, is something that's going to be truly special and I think unique uh, to help our program grow going forward. Well, of course, today is our first day of classes. Uh, so I, I wanted to, to ask you, you know, uh, as our fall semester is getting kicked off, um, what, are, what are you most excited about? I, well, I'm excited about seeing the students. So I, I've, I've spent the last few weeks working on classes, trying to understand, okay, do I need to show them this? How do I introduce myself? How do I present the slides? How do I plug in the computer to the, <laughs> to the, the room? But I, I think I'm just excited to meet the students and finally get this going. You know, it's it's been theory and it's been a long time since I've been on a podium, uh, but now it's implementation. I am just looking for the excitement within the classroom and the and the live feedback that I'm going to get from our students and interacting with them and then exploring what they want to know, seeking out, you know, what they're thirsty to know and providing that information. So I, I'm super excited. Well, good. I, again, I, I think uh, everybody would agree with that in terms of. Uh, you know, new starter semester starting off the enthusiasm that goes along with that and and your coming to our program, I think, adds that much more excitement to the things that we were already doing and helps us to to grow this program to the next level. In fact, so um, personal question, right? When um, when you're not saving the world for intelligence, um, what's your favorite hobby? Well, so I, I do run a little bit, but I love golf. Uh, Depending on the assignment that I had uh, in the Marine Corps, I was either a two handicap or a 12 handicap because sometimes you got to play and sometimes you never saw the clubs. But but I love golf. Myrtle Beach is, is the great home of golf out here. So I really hope to get uh, my golf game back in shape. I haven't done it enough. So that's one of the things I, I love to do. I love the time out there. I love the challenges and, and working on improving that. Well. Wow. As you said, Myrtle Beach is a place for golf. In fact, actually, of course, Coastal's uh, PGA program uh, means that we have a golf course, of course, tied to campus. And uh, I, I have I have not a great golfer myself, but I have been known to, to take an hour off and, and go drive a bucket of balls down on the driving range. So, uh, yeah. but hopefully, hopefully, we can we can make both of these uh, come together. <laughs> well, let's hope so. I I I did find where the course was one of my first tours of the campus. So I know where that is. Right. Reconnaissance, right? Exactly. <laughs> so one last question, and again, this is just kind of a kind of an, a, an odd one, but again, in your experience of more than 30 years uh, as an intelligence officer, uh, I'm sure you've had many deployments. Uh, I, I wanted to know, you know, if you would share with us, perhaps your, your most interesting or funniest deployment story you, you came across. Well, <clears throat> there's funny haha, -ha, and then there's funny not so haha, -ha, uh, as you well <laughs> know from, from your your time. Uh, sure. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I I don't know where where exactly to fit. I could talk about banana spiders in Okinawa, and as a <laughs> as a young dumb marine playing with those, which you never want to do that. But that has nothing to do with intelligence. I think <clears throat> a funny sort of haha -ha was back in 1990, uh, Saddam Hussein decided he was going to get some oil in Kuwait. And, and our unit in Hawaii had, we got there in a matter of 10 days or so. And, and those were in the days where you would deploy without your equipment because there were three ships that were going to bring all the equipment you needed. Well, we deployed without our equipment 
to the desert in Saudi Arabia. And it took 20 some odd days for our equipment to get there. So we're in these warehouses. And I remember it was a few days after we got there. It was early October or September starting to come up. And there was big talk that we were going to get attacked. And all we had were rifles and, and MREs. And, and back then, the MREs weren't as good as these young guys and gals have it today. So they were melting in the heat. We could cook our MREs on the, on the pavement. And, and then we finally got our equipment, and that was it. So I don't know if that's funny. Ha-ha, but it wasn't too funny at the time. <laughs> emblematic of a military operation right it's a it's exactly hurry up and wait with a lot of chaos yeah as it says semper gumby right always flexible exactly <laughs> well mark let, we'll go ahead and stop here for today thank you for for taking the time to speak with me and and letting everyone know about your experiences and what you bring to our program at coastal like i said we are really excited to have you here and we're really looking forward to what we get to do uh, in the years going forward as a result of that. For those of you, by the way, who are, are watching in, if you want to have more information on the Intelligence and National Security Studies program that we have here at Coastal Carolina, you can go to Coastal's website. It's coastal.edu slash intelligence. That's coastal.edu slash intelligence. And that will bring you to our program's webpage and give you a little bit more information about the program. And also, you certainly can feel free to reach out and contact me, Dr. Jonathan Smith. Um, again, my email is johnsmith at coastal.edu, and I am happy to answer any questions that you have. So, again, Mark, thank you very much for, for taking the time to, to speak with us and share uh, your experiences, and we will go ahead and sign off for today. All right. Thank you, John. It's a great opportunity and honor. Yep. Thank you very much.